Welcome to Renegade Inc., the show that allows us to think differently. It's been long said that if a country has a large financial sector, prosperity naturally trickles down. If so, why is the UK inequality so very high? In fact, why is global inequality so high? And why are bankers at pains to distance themselves from the reputation of their industry? For many years, we've been told that finance is good and more finance is better. But on this programme, we ask a very simple question. Can a country suffer from a finance curse? Joining me to discuss whether a dominant financial sector is a good or bad thing for a country and her people are City veteran David Buick. He calls himself a humble global financial commentator. Very few of those around. Well, I'm one of them. <laughs> uh, and, um, and we're delighted to have international banking and finance professor Richard Werner here, the man who coined the term quantitative easing and someone who has thought long and hard about the pluses and minuses of financialization. Uh, welcome to you both. Um, Good to be here. David, in your own words, you're deeply and irrevocably committed to the City of London. Why? I think what I've seen over the last 54 years that I've been in the City, that the infrastructure really, as regards the financial services, has been built up over 70 years, since the war really. And then we had, of course, the introduction of a certain number of IPOs, which were every day in the broadsheets, as the economy was building up after the war, followed by the explosion of the Eurodollar market in the 70s, then followed by the abolition of exchange control, which Margaret Thatcher introduced in 1980. Right. That is more significant to me than Big Bang by a long way, for the simple reason it suddenly is we're open for business. Any currency you like, no restrictions, and the world, in terms of financial banks, exploded. At the end of the 70s, there were over 300 trading banks in the city of London. By the 80s, there'd obviously been a lot of mergers, and then with talk of Big Bang in 1986, erosion of large or small banks was very significant. So you think a financial sector within a developed economy, however big, is a good thing? Is that the right thing to do? If you've got the correct regulation, if you've got the correct people working in the banks, and if you've got the correct infrastructure, your tie, your suit, your watch, this table, nothing happens without a bank. And people However they dislike them and however they distrust them, like it or not, without banks, nothing works. There is no economy. End of. Um, I just want to have you to have a look at this, this graph. To frame it, it's UK private debt since 1880. I mean, you can see what happens around the Great Depression. Uh, and then suddenly Thatcher comes to power, private debt takes off. One of the things that's happened since the financial crisis, and we have to give the Bank of England full marks for this, is that they virtually made the banks in London double their capital to do the same amount of business, which means that they should be geared up for any financial crisis that there may be. So, and the biggest threat from a financial crisis, as far as I'm concerned, is mortgages, because it is easily and significantly the most amount of money lent. And if you were, for whatever reason, to have a terrible crisis, they have the ability within the banks to be able to take it, not necessarily a hit, but to give people time to regroup. Richard. Uh, financial sector, a, a bloated or a dominant financial sector, its effect, in your view, on the real economy? Well, first of all, it's interesting that um, the national income accountants who think a lot about the overall economy, how to measure it and how to, you know, structure the data, they actually have been struggling for decades with uh, the question, what to do with the financial sector? Why? Because uh, GDP is actually created by national income accounting by adding up value-added activities. And that's where the financial sector has a problem. What is the value added? Um, and it's, it's been so difficult that essentially the um, national accounting statisticians have to make up a fictional value and just add it onto GDP and say, okay, that's, we can say that maybe is, is what the financial sector is doing. Because essentially, there is no value added, there's value extracted. And so, really, you need to subtract it from GDP. Has the finance sector, the fire sector, has it become a cost center? Because is, is, the, as, you know, is there a sweet spot where it's actually serving humanity, society, and facilitating business? And when it becomes a profit generator in and of itself, it becomes detrimental to the wider, to the wider world. Start with you. Well, exactly. Um, even the mainstream textbooks in finance, banking, and macro monetary economics will will show banks 
as financial intermediaries. Now, there's, there's a problem with that. It's clear there is a high price that we're paying for this, what should be a humble intermediation service that's being performed. And the salaries that are being paid I, are uh, you know, famously very high, which is very strange if they're just intermediaries. If I could interject here, um, again, I agree 100% with what he said, but we need to put this in perspective because all this fearful, uh, dreadful press that we've been reading about Lloyds Bank, 16 billion pounds with a PPI and Deutsche Bank being fined for this and Barclays being fined for that and Standard Bank money laundering and all this stuff. This was all 2003 to 2008. The regulator has stepped up to the plate in a very big way. And we had that situation, you recall, when Bob Dunn was absolutely stripped of his raiment in front of the Treasury Select Committee when he was chief executive of Barclays because the bonuses paid by the, to the staff was greater than the dividend paid to the entire bank that year. This was appalling. All of it, though, was backed or, or, or underwritten, if you like, by the taxpayer. Exactly. That was making it even more... That doesn't happen in London now. Are you sure about that? I'm absolutely positive. I promise you, things have changed. I'm not saying people aren't still earning pretty decent money. They are. But it isn't swags of cash in, you know, that goes all the way to the bank. For an intermediary mm -hmm. service, it's a hell of a cost. If you want to facilitate trade and, and get, yeah, get the real economy moving you're again... You're absolutely what, right. What, why does all this money end up in the cul-de-sac of financial services? It doesn't matter if you're building a factory, whether you're wearing a suit, this table, they all come from banks. And so you, you have to go to the kernel of life. You're, you're about to make a point, and if you don't, I'll make it, that there was a rotten call there, and it was shocking. I'm glad you said it. No, no I did. And I've been, trust me, some of the stuff that I've said over the last 15 years, I'm deeply embarrassed over, because <laughs> I was unaware of a lot of these terrible things like the PPI and some of this money laundering. I'm appalled, absolutely appalled, because we had soft regulation under Gordon Brown and he abrogated every bit of responsibility. I want the risk makers to take more risk. Come on. We need somebody to put a grip on it, and that's what we didn't have during that period. If you've got this amount of private debt, then ultimately the financial sector becomes political. It has to, because it has so much power. Yep, wouldn't uh, argue. Just let's listen to John Kay, the economist, and his view. It's, it's interesting some of the differences between countries and all of this. If one takes the finance industry, we all have the same problem that the industry is too politically powerful. The mechanisms are a bit different. In the US, it's basically campaign funding. In continental Europe, it's largely the kind of natural corporatism that means that Germany tends to equate German interests in finance with the interests of Deutsche Bank and similarly France with those of BNP Paribas and Socgen and so on. The national champions phenomenon essentially. Now in Britain we have a bit of the national champions phenomenon. We also have what I thought Adair Turner got to part of the heart of it when he talked about intellectual capture. The people who work in the city are smart, rich. It's not surprising that politicians are somewhat deferential to them, and they are. People are, uh, who work in the city are smart, rich, there's intellectual capture, they're politically engaged because they have to be, they have to lobby. If you follow that logically, where does that end up? I think there's a structural problem, that is the concentration of the banking sector. So in the UK, five banks account for 90% of deposits which is one of the most concentrated banking systems in the world. In Germany, um, those high street banks account for 12% of deposits and 70% of deposits are accounted for by 1,500 local not-for-profit community banks. There is a general tendency when an organization gets large and larger and larger and gets very big, um, essentially, decisions are made without accountability and the temptations of power strike. Lord Acton famously put it this way, you know, um, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So when you have very large banks and only five of them dominating the economy and through the political mechanism and the already financial sector centered political system and political infrastructure, you know, the city of London 
having a person in parliament that is not elected, the remembrancer, uh, and you know, all these rights of the square mile as a sovereign state, you know, all these things. And the Queen needs permission and to go there, right? Exactly. And so what you will get is large banks only wanting to deal with large customers in order to do large deals. And that's also where you get the large bonuses. Well, we've done a study on the US, which has the biggest banking sector in the world, over 15,000 banks of all sizes and shapes. The very large banks deal with the very large customers, give very large loans. The medium-sized banks give medium-sized loans. Who is lending to small firms? It is only the small banks. Now, the UK doesn't have those. So the structure has become too concentrated, and what is badly needed in the UK is decentralization. One has to break up the, the financial sector and um, have much smaller units because small banks, community banks are locally accountable. You can't suddenly do a crazy project or you know, big corruption because people see what you're doing. But I think you'd argue for decentralised banking system, wouldn't you? Even though you're a city uh, oh, devotee. Oh, no, without a doubt, but... but because it's anti I'd like, Richard, I'd like Richard to comment on this because I am, and I, as I'm sure Richard is, but we've had our metro banks, we've had our older malls, we've had our one savings. Challenger banks, Challenger, all the Challenger, Challenger, Challenger banks. banks. We've had uh, Handels Bank or Handels Bank and has done a fantastic job, but it's still tiny. Exactly. Now, they will stay tiny. The ones um, that are UK challenger banks and that are profit-oriented. You, know, you know why? Because the moment they get a bit bigger, yeah. they will be bought up and they will disappear. This is exactly what happened over the last yeah. 100 years. On that note, uh, that's it for this half. Join us for more of this debate after this short break. Uh, we'll be talking more about the great financial paradox with city champion David Buick and international finance and banking professor Richard Vernon. Welcome back to Renegade Inc., the show that allows us to think differently. Uh, before we talk about the finance curse with Professor Richard Werner, let's have a quick look at this week's Renegade Inc. index. We start with our favourite tweets. Ian Fraser tweets, he's pointing out the revolving door between politics and finance. Former Prime Minister Gordon Brown, now working for PIMCO. Tony Blair, another former Prime Minister, he's at JP Morgan. Alistair Darling, remember him? Uh, he's at Morgan Stanley. Mandelson, Peter, he's at Lazard's. Uh, William Haig is at City, along with Mervyn King. See a pattern? And that austerity merchant, George Osborne, he's at BlackRock. Cozy little setup. London School of Economics, uh, they reveal that one in three Londoners do not have the income needed for a minimum standard of living. Possibly something to do with that austerity. And on a lighter note, Colin McKay tweets an astonishing photo taken in the late 70s showing a man feeding a polar bear and her cubs milk in the North Russian border. Shooting a bear doesn't make you a badass, feeding one while her cub pumps your leg certainly does, and we couldn't agree more. Our book of the week is Makers and Takers, The uh, Rise of Finance and the Fall of American Business by Rana Furaha. The book offers a blistering critique of how Wall Street's zero-sum thinking came to dominate and then hobble the US economy. She's no socialist, but she does outline that finance for the sake of finance is bad for business and capitalism as a whole. Traditionally, finance served the needs of the makers by providing capital and investing in long-term growth. But today, it's become an end in itself, a closed system totally detached from tangible economic activity that we all need. And with that in mind, we join our data journalist, Andrew Keith Walker, who's thinking about the influence of the dominant fire sector, financial insurance and real estate, on British quality of life. If you come to Greenwich Park and look around at the surrounding landscape, it's easy to forget that a lot of what you're looking at hasn't changed that much since the 1970s. You know, for most people, they are better off, and they've seen steady growth since the end of World War II, about 2.1% year on year on average. But for the 10% who work in those towers over there, their incomes have grown at twice that rate. The truth of the matter is we feel a lot better off than we did in the 1970s. House prices have gone through the roof. Salaries have kept ahead of inflation. We've got flat screen TVs, iPhones, Wi-Fi, nicer cars. But we've paid for a lot of that stuff with credit and we've saved a lot less money as a result. And so in real terms, we're not actually that much better off 
unlike the top 10%. Now, the incomes for the top 10% really started to rise in the 1980s when we saw the deregulation of the banking sector. And a lot of that growth is what built the towers behind us. But something else happened in the 1980s. The Gini coefficient, which is a way of measuring income inequality, grew by about 30%, and it stayed at pretty much at that level ever since. So the gap got wider and has stayed wider for a long time. That's why the United Kingdom is ranked seventh out of the world's top 30 developed economies for inequality. So those skyscrapers behind me, they're not just a symbol of the economic prosperity that the Big Bang brought in the 1980s and the huge boom of the banking sector after that. They're also a monument to the sharpest rise in inequality in this country for the last 100 years. Richard, when you think about inequality, inequality in the UK, and it's a hot topic, and you think about, as you'd like the banking sector to be uh, decentralised, flatter structure, more resilient, how do you begin to uh, talk to the public or the political class about achieving those goals? Essentially, you know, if, if, if um, we want to produce something, we need funding, so there's a role for banks in almost everything that's happening in the economy. But what exactly is that role? I just Quickly, I'd like to reflect on that. Banks are being thought of as intermediaries, but this are is they? not really what's happening. Banks... What, what are they then? They're creators of the money supply. So you're firmly of the view that banks create money out of thin air? Yes, well, I, I produced the first empirical studies to prove that um, in the 5,000-year history of banking. Banks are thought of as uh, deposit-taking institutions that lend money. The legal reality is banks don't take deposits and banks don't lend money. So what is a deposit? A deposit is not actually a deposit. It's not a bailment. It's not held in custody. Uh, at law, the word deposit is meaningless. The law courts and various judgments have made it very clear if you give your money to a bank, even though it's called a deposit, this money is simply a loan to the bank. That's true. Yeah. So there is no such thing as a deposit. So There's you think it's poorly it's adequately named then? So mm. banks borrow from the public. OK, so that much we've established. What about lending? Surely they're lending money. Um, no, they don't. Banks don't lend money. Banks, again, at law, it's very clear, they're in the business of purchasing securities. That's it. So you say, OK, don't you know, confuse me with all that legalese. No. I want a loan. I want a loan. Yeah. Fine. Here's the loan contract. Here's the offer letter. And you sign. At law, it's very clear, you have issued a security, namely a promissory note. And the bank is going to purchase that. That's what's happening at Put law. it in layman's terms. What does that mean? It means that um, what the bank is doing is very different from what it presents to the public that it's doing. How does this fit together? So you say, fine, the bank purchases my promissory note, but how do I get my money? I want, you know, it's a I loan. Want I want my 200 my grand, right? And I don't care about the details, I want the money. The bank will say, well, you'll find it in your account with us. That would be technically correct. If they say, we'll transfer it to your account, that's wrong, because no money is transferred at all. It's already in From the bank. anywhere inside the bank or outside the bank. Why? Because what we call a deposit is simply the bank's record of its debt to the public. Now, it also owes you money, and its record of the money it owes you is what you think you're getting as money. And that's all it is. And that is how the banks create the money supply. The money supply consists to 97% of bank deposits. And these are created out of nothing by banks when they lend because they invent fictitious customer deposits. Why? They simply restate, slightly incorrectly in accounting terms, what is an accounts payable liability arising from the loan contract having purchased your promissory note as a customer deposit, but nobody has deposited any money. I wonder how the FCA deals with this, because in the financial sector, you're supposed to not mislead your customers. <laughs> um, anyway, I, so, I, have, I don't have the answer so the, so the banks create the money supply yes. by inventing these claims on themselves, the, you know, the fictitious deposits. That can be actually positive for the economy, as long as this money creation is in line with the creation of new goods and services, uh, implementation of new technologies and therefore adding value and adding value in the economy is funded by this money creation. If that happens, and we're talking about um, business investment, productive loans, productive bank credit, you will have no inflation. These loans can also be serviced and repaid and you have a stable economy without problems and with low inequality. And so countries that achieve this, that the banks lend mainly for productive purposes, whether it's Germany in much of its 200-year history or 
Um, in the last century, the East Asian economies where bank credit was largely for productive purposes, then you're fine. But there's two more cases. I quickly need to point them out because that's the contrast. But just, just, just clarify that, that inequality is, is significantly it's lower. Lower, yes. Inflation is if, low. If, yes. And, and, the real, and, the, growth and the real economy thrives. Is booming, yes. That's when bank credit creation is focused on um, productive lending for productive purposes. As opposed to speculation and, and asset as, price. As opposed to, there's are two other types. If banks create credit for consumption, it's yes. obvious what's going to happen. You suddenly have more money create, created and more demand for goods, but it's the same amount of goods and services. So you're creating consumer price inflation. Price That's going. well understood. And, and central banks are watching that a little bit. And what's but the what's, what's less well understood is, and what's the biggest in the UK, um, it's probably more than 70% of all lending, um, actually way more than that, Mortgage, um, is yeah. bank credit creation, so money creation uh, for financial transactions, for asset transactions, for purchasing ownership rights. Now then you have a problem, why? Because you're creating new money, but you're not creating new goods and services. You're simply, They're constant, aren't they? you're giving somebody new purchasing power over existing assets and therefore you must push up asset prices. So this, you can, you can draw a chart where you show you know, asset prices, land prices, property prices in the UK, and they will match very closely as, as we have, I've shown in, in Japan and other countries. And that also creates the inequality. So when the, the banking sector has focused too much on unproductive lending, and the UK is dominant. It strikes me that what you're telling me, and tell me I'm wrong, is that lending, in order to get round this deposit stroke loan situation, needs to be categorised. You're right, exactly. Is that right? That's right. Um, we need to look at where the money is going. That makes a whole world difference. of difference. Okay. So if money, is, is bank credit, is extended for productive purposes, you're fine. You'll get a good economy, no inflation, and financial stability. And also, you don't have this inequality problem. And do you think there should be different capital ratios towards no. each? No, capital, the whole Basel capital approach doesn't work. Why? Because it's, it's premised on the idea that banks are just financial intermediaries. But they're not. They're money creators. We need bank regulation that recognizes reality of how the banks actually operate. So what you're saying, this is a regulation problem? Clearly, yes, it's a regulation problem. That's right. We need uh, different regulation. And the only regulation that actually has succeeded in, in history, and we have good data for the 20th century in particular, in preventing asset bubbles and banking crises, which are all driven by this bank credit for financial transactions, you know, leads to this asset boom, and it's, it's a game of musical chairs, you know, you have to play it, it's mm -hmm. rational to play it while the music is playing, which is how asset prices are driven by ever more bank credit for financial transactions. The moment it stops, asset prices fall, you get the first bankruptcies, banks get risk averse, the whole thing goes into reverse and banks go bust. But you can avoid this, and the only regulation that has succeeded in avoiding this is guidance of bank credit, simple rules. Um, the simplest form of bank credit guidance is to simply ban bank credit for um, financial transactions. It doesn't mean financial transactions are bad. No, let the speculators speculate and let them even borrow money, but not from banks. That would make a whole world who, of difference. Who do they borrow it from? Well, they can issue bonds or you know, borrow in the markets, whatever they want. But that's risk But they, they shouldn't get access to it's the public privilege of money creation, you I see. I know what you mean, yeah. And that creates the problem that creates the boom-bust cycles. But in some countries, they've succeeded in preventing this asset inflation. Which ones? Such as Germany, without even credit guidance, by having a banking structure, a banking system, that's dominated by banks that don't want to do this financial speculation in the first place. These are the community banks. So Germany was 70% of banks. What do you call the Landers banks? Being, yeah. No, not no. the Landers banks, the smaller ones, the 1,500 okay. right. Volksbank and Raiffeisen Bank. Okay. They're actually the main banks in Germany. There's so many of them, each is small. And they lend mainly for productive purposes to small and medium-sized enterprises. The Mittelstand, which has been the backbone of German economic success for the last 200 years, despite wars and disasters, has only been successful because they also have their local small banks funding them all the way through. That doesn't exist in the UK, and that's been why the small and medium-sized enterprise sector always has, has had a problem in the UK. So we're stuck with speculation and horrific property porn renovation shows. Well, the solution is, of course, to create these small banks. We need to create small banks. They're the natural lenders to small firms. The public wants stable growth, None of this boom-bust cycle, banking crisis, public money used to bail out banks. People don't want that. In Germany, these community banks, 
It's very interesting dominant, because they've never used public money in these 200 years. Not a single one has ever been bailed out with public money, and no depositor has lost any money. Although, Richard, your argument is complex, principles are terribly simple. It is very simple. And although you, are, actually, although you're a little defeatist, I'm not. Def you yeah, maybe I'm defeatist, I'm, but but I like it. But uh, it's just the idea of. <laughs> How can I put it? Go on. Getting, getting through the regulatory, they are so reluctant. But that's why it is hard work. But that's, hard why work. We, that's why we got you in. We're going we're gonna to have you as I think the ambassador. It's, uh, it's, I, I, think, I, I have to say, uh, this has been brilliantly explained. We open with the question, do we have a, fi a finance curse? Does the UK have a finance curse, David? No. I think it has difficulties, but I think those difficulties have been in, look, appeared insurmountable five years ago. Now I think the occasion... Uh, says that it's much better, but there is this severe danger of over-regulation, which is completely understandable, not wanting a replication of what happened in 2008. Has the UK got a finance curse? Is it a trick question? Because the UK doesn't have finance. The City of London has, and it's not part of the UK. Good answer. <laughs> it, it, Good answer. Easy. It's international, is right. The city of London is outside the United Kingdom, do you know that? It's, it's really shocking. And it, therefore it's also not part of the EU, which explains... Uh, the, although it couldn't be part of the EU because you have to have democratic elections and the city of London doesn't, right? It's, it's the banks that have the votes, right? Right. Per staff, you know, I the know, vote is... Like how, how do you start yeah. unpicking this puzzle? I know, <laughs> that's a very useful piece of information. And of course it's not <laughs> part of the UK. It's a pretty dangerous piece and of information. <laughs> and it's not part of the UK because the Queen is not allowed to enter without permission. She's not the sovereign, therefore it's not part of the UK. It's, you know, and of course that's since, you know, 1688. I have to, I have to make a note. Since the foreign invasion. <laughs> there you go, David. That dinner you're going to tonight, just drop that in. God, Penultimate really? bit of the speech. They'll love it. Gentlemen, thank you so very much. Um, David Buick, Richard Werner. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your time. That's it from Renegade Inc. HQ this week. You can drop the team an email, studio at renegadeinc.com, or tweet us at Renegade Inc. Join us next week for more insight from those people who are thinking differently. But until then, stay curious. Thank you.